Marvel Studios special Werewolf by Night has debuted on Disney Plus. So let's talk about it. Hi, my name is Sean, and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Share your spoiler-packed thoughts on Werewolf by Night. As this is a spoiler review, feel free to spoil away down below in the comment section. No need for a spoiler warning. Now, I was lucky enough to actually be at the public world premiere of Werewolf by Night. They played it as a surprise screening at Fantastic Fest, which I was attending, and so I was in the room with the first audience ever that got to see this special presentation. And along those same lines, this is our first Marvel Studios special presentation like this, where it's not a movie, it's not a TV show, it's something in the middle. So it's interesting, refreshing, different, all of those things. And now I can talk spoilers about it, so let's get started with my general thoughts. And if you missed my spoiler-free review of Werewolf by Night, I thoroughly enjoyed what they had to offer here. It's new, it's different, it's efficient, it establishes a new lore, it has its own distinct style, it's gnarly, it's violent, it feels free just spraying blood all over the place. And in fact, my biggest issue with, with it was that it was only 50 minutes long, and I'm totally fine with doing something much shorter. I don't think that every movie that Marvel does needs to be an epic blockbuster, but at 50 minutes, it's it's just too short if you're trying to introduce a new set of characters, introduce a new mythology, and introduce a conflict that is developed, has twists, turns, and, and has a satisfying ending. You know, you make it even like hour and 20 minutes, which would be a very short film, but maybe perfect for something like this that's it's supposed to be small in scale. But, you know, this one, I just wish that there was more of it. With that said, let's start walking through the episode and talk, or not episode, through the special, start talking about specifics. So in the first minutes of the special, it establishes that the Bloodstone family hunt down monsters. They are powered by the Bloodstone itself, and the patriarch of the family has died. A bunch of people are convening at his funeral, where he announces that of all the hunters that have gathered there, whoever is able to slay the monster first and grab the stone will be the person that inherits it and can continues his legacy of monster hunting. And through this process, we also realize that he has a daughter that probably was supposed to get this thing, but she appears to have abandoned the family, gone off and kind of done her own thing, and her stepmother doesn't like her, her dad seemed to have disowned her, and even in the little room where they're about to have this competition, people look at her and they, they scoff at her, like, what is she doing here? We're like, we've killed all these monsters, she's just here, and... She's allowed to participate, but people don't seem to care for her at all. And it doesn't have to, like, over-explain everything. You can pretty just pretty quickly just piece it together. Which is one thing I kind of appreciated, the way that the whole thing was kind of designed. That because there's not enough time to pause and have her, like, pause, sit back and go, My dad sucked as a dad, and he was always off hunting monsters, and I didn't think that that was right, that he was hunting them without caring to know them at all. Like, he doesn't have to pause to explain everything about her disagreements with her dad. You can just piece it together. You can figure it out on your own, and it, and it doesn't insult the audience's intelligence. And almost maybe the short runtime meant that they had to write it a little bit smarter where the audience is kind of piecing together her dynamic with her family. There's even, I didn't even catch this the first time through of, uh, you know, early on, it's made clear that she left 20 years ago. She's not been around the family. And her stepmother says, like, you know, you haven't even been trained. So everyone in the room thinks she doesn't even know what she's doing. She can't even fight. And she responds back. And I, I noticed the second time around, she goes, I wasn't trained by him. So she left 20 years ago, still went off training. She went off to learn stuff. She just didn't want to learn from her dad, who's she apparently had big, gigantic disagreements with. And so you just fill in the gaps of all of this. And as you go into it, you realize, okay, she clearly knows how to fight, take care of herself, um, and survive. And they, they even put a line of dialogue in there that doesn't have to say much at all. It doesn't have to elaborate on anything. It just creates a space for your imagination to fill in the gaps with what you do see and what you do know. 
So we know he didn't train her, but we know she did train, which kind of real quickly establishes all of this. And there's one kind of mysterious guy in there that he says he has over 100 kills, uh, or over two, what, I don't say, over 100 or 100, over 200 kills, but he has by far the most kills in the room. Uh, but he's acting a little bit suspicious as to what exactly is going on. Clearly, the people there don't know each other all that well, but maybe they know of each other's reputations. And then they're sent off to go hunt a monster in a maze. And just in general, I like those types of stories. I, I like action movies and things like that. So combine it with like monster hunters, throw them in a maze in this interesting location. Everyone has a different weapon of choice, different set of skills. Send them out there to hunt each other, to hunt the monster, to try and gain something. It's a very simple, straightforward plot, especially compared to what you normally get with Marvel, where it's much kind of bigger in scope and size. There's layers to it. There's complexity. And here, it's real simple. Here's a group of people. Go over there. Whoever gets this thing wins. Very straightforward. But then from there, it's a matter of like, okay, what are people's motivations who is lying about something. So the daughter's not really lying about what she's doing. It's just a matter of, okay, if she's been gone for 20 years, why is she coming back to get it? Why why is she here if she left, doesn't care about this stuff? Mysterious guy that doesn't seem out to hunt the way these other dudes are. And then there's a bunch of dudes that just kind of exist to for this world of hunting monsters. Send out everybody into the maze, kickstart things. And this is this in particular is where I feel that ten more minutes, fifteen more minutes makes a big difference. Cause if like I appreciate the brevity of like very quickly, very efficiently, we set up situation, establish our characters, where there's a little bit of mystery, send them off. All right, cool, get right to it. But if if you want to have a story about this hunt, plus you want to have a twist and turn where our our man thing gets to escape and then that sets up our third act where it's like, we'll have the werewolf eat her. But you've only got 50 minutes, in which case the actual hunt itself just, I mean, you go out there, you have a couple shots of people like slowly walking around looking and then a fight breaks out, and this thing's already halfway over. <laughs> it's the, of the amount of time of the actual thing that was set up initially, where there there was more fun to be had right here of um, showing people trying to hunt each other, showing people fighting each other, and then I think you could add more with... I think Man-Thing gets underplayed here. I wish we got more with Man-Thing, because we start going through things, our werewolf quickly finds him, there's a first to find him and you realize, oh, okay, this guy's not here to hunt the man thing. He's here to release the man thing. Okay, that's kind of interesting. That's a fun little plot twist. And once again, there's the, this is where if you had that 15, 15 more minutes, you can add a little bit more to this because it's like, all right, I got these bombs. I can blow up the wall. Let's just meet up at the wall and let you out of here. Well, that's awfully easy. To, like It has to be that easy if you only have 50 minutes, but you can see where there's a little bit more you could do there. To, to kind of uh, stretch this out a little bit in the in the interesting way, because stories are compelling based off the difficulty of the conflicts that people have to overcome. And so if it's just, I've got, I've got a bomb that can blow up the wall, cool, nice and easy, as opposed to we have to find a way to blow up the wall and I can do that while you sneak around here because you're really big and tall and I can sneak around and you can't. So we'll create the, that. That's what I'm talking about when I say, I don't need it to be drastically different. But to make it that, like, it's really cool right now, but it can get to that extra level if you just add 15, 20 minutes to it. Just add a little bit more to the obstacles they're trying to overcome, the conflicts that they're facing. A little bit more to it. as a, Like, when it's just right there, he shows up and he just has the thing that he needs. That means you, you can always take it out of his hand and say he needs to get that from over there as a conflict. That's the we storytelling, but you only have 50 minutes. That's where you start doing things like he already has the thing. They already know what they need to do. Just need to get there. So I wish that's that's when I say that. And I don't have too many more things to add like that. But this middle section is where I wish they had a little bit more time. But it's just like a fun little twist. You're going through it. There's this vicious monster you got to go fight. And when we first find the monster, it gives someone a big hug. Where you, th you think at first the way that's set up the the deal here is that 
our characters need to go hunt the bad guy. Then you realize the bad guy's not the bad guy at all. He's the guy that's been captured and is being hunted. So he, he <laughs> we're, we were, we're rooting for him. So now kind of moving right along, we get our first fight with Elsa. She gets into a number of little scuffles with people. And I, I might've gotten the order a little bit wrong on this one, but so she's running and she runs into our, our werewolf friend and she pauses for a second. Like she's not looking to just immediately kill people, but he more importantly is like, Hey, why don't we just go our separate ways? Why don't, why don't, and he's right there, puts that thought in your head. Like this guy seems to have different motives than everyone else. Like he, I, I'm not sure what this guy's up to. And before they can even talk through all of this, someone else shows up trying to kill them. And so Elsa gets into um, her first of many fights and she gets into several of these little scuffles, but they're all like, just like real quick. It's like guy swings axe at her. She does her cool spinny flip throw down leg thingy, throws the guy down, grabs the axe, runs around the corner. And then she sees a door open and cuts a hand off and chokes a guy out and literally when she waits there, you're like, oh, these could have been a little bit longer. Not, not that every fight needs to be a total epic boss fight. But when your fight with a guy is, he swings an axe, you do flippy thing, throw him on the ground and run away. You can immediately go like, all right, yeah, just right there. That that could have been 30 seconds longer, real easily. Like just each of these could be just 30 seconds longer. And you do, that makes them a little bit more satisfying, a little bit more cool stuff kind of happening in there. Um, and so eventually she she's in a number of these little deals. She gets injured just a little bit through her little scuffles. And then she shuffles into... Um, the crypt with all the coffin peep coffins and everything. Um, and our, our eventually our, um, werewolf friend is on the run himself from someone trying to not get in a fight, runs in, closes the door, not realizing, realizing that it locks behind them where these two characters that seem to have very different motives from everyone else. Everyone else is out for blood, trying to kill each other, trying to kill the monster. And then these two get in there and they're, have different backgrounds that we need to learn about uh, where you realize that she doesn't seem to agree with her family's background and he is there not to kill the monster, but to save the monster, to set the monster free. And once again, kind of going to that runtime thing of because the fights are so quick, when you sit down for just two minutes to talk, but you only had a 15 second fight, it makes the conversation seem that much longer. And it's an appropriately long conversation that communicates what it needs to communicate at a fairly efficient pace. But when you don't have time to have a fight, but you have time to have a conversation in your action piece, it, it, it highlights that things just slow down a good bit. So once again, just make everything a little bit longer. Strict, or you add a little bit in there, 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. I think it makes a huge difference with this one. Of course, 20 minutes when your deal's less than an hour long is also adding 40% to your runtime. So it actually is quite a bit in this context. But um, in a conversation, you realize that he he's trying to help his friend, Ted. And so they're going to team up so that Ted can be freed and she can get the stone and not all these other people. And through their conversations, she remembers, oh yeah, my aunt actually hid keys in here because she always thought she was going to come back from the dead and didn't want to be stuck in here. So they realize they have keys, grab the keys. And... Uh, set themselves free. So through, throughout the course of this, you also get a little shot in there where the, what is it, Scottish guy goes to battle with Man-Thing and Man-Thing captures, captures him pretty quickly and does whatever his deal is and he like disintegrates, disintegrates the guy's head and just immediately you start to like, the stuff that you can get away with with black and white where you get a person screaming in agony as they're like disintegrating um, and in black and white, it's not nearly as horrifying as if you have it in color and can see what's actually kind of going on underneath with color variation. Likewise, earlier in it, when she cuts the guy's arm off, I didn't, like, I remember there being a bunch of blood in it before, but you really kind of, watching it the second time, like, cuts the arm off. When he throws the body, blood just sprays out of his arm in the air, which those are, the, like, the little details where the difference between what is, like, normally PG-13 and R of you can show a little bit of blood when someone gets injured in PG-13, but when it's like body thrown around, there's just blood spraying everywhere. Someone gets shot in the face and then it pauses to show their face with an ax in it. There's like two different times where it pauses to show the ax in it. 
And I've uh, been watching through the Halloween movies, Friday the 13th movies recently, and and all throughout the special features, they talk about the battles with the MPAA, and like, we could only show the axe in the face for half a second, and if we showed it for two seconds, they told us absolutely not, so we had to keep trimming it back, got it back to half a second, where you could just show that it's in there, but you can't linger on it. And now we're watching this Marvel special, and two different times, it just lingers on the weapon inside of a person's face <laughs> like they they actually went for it but it's probably even a piece of where, why they had to do the creative decision to go black and white but it means that you can go gory and violent as well but so then they get out and scottish guy gets disintegrated in nice gnarly fashion and all of it kind of leads to the point in time where our, our two people kind of get separated and werewolf man goes to try and blow up the wall she goes to try and get Ted help him escape and there's a little bit of that Marvel humor in there where he's trying to get it stuck on the wall and he keeps getting it wrong so he has to keep running up to a bomb that's about to explode and we finally realize oh I just put it in the crack and then we'll be good to go and then Elsa runs up I believe right as the guy gets disintegrated so she sees like this is a dangerous creature I am running up to it's like Ted um and there's something just very amusing about this very unhuman creature with such a boring name first name oh and the the what they could do with um animation of faces these days where you can actually take this monstrous creature and they figure out how to animate eyebrows and facial features to even like eyes opening wide so you can even tell like going from just creepy monster to oh we're friends just through the movements of a monster's face and you know what what it's thinking as eventually uh monster thing escapes They grab the stone off of his back as Man-Thing is escaping. Once again, wish we had more time here with our Man-Thing because you you just get to the idea that, okay, he's friendly and likes to give hugs. His first name is Ted. He can disintegrate people and he can make facial expressions. Then he's gone. Shows up. We get, you know, glimpses of him a couple more times, but we don't get a lot of time with him. So Man-Thing introduced in the MC. We don't get a lot of time with him, though. If he gave us 15, 20 more minutes... My recurring theme here, and I'll stop saying that when we move into the third act, because the third act, I think, was actually paced better. It's this middle act where I feel like we could have had more each fight longer, a little bit more complexity, a little bit more in this part right here. Man-Thing escapes, and uh, Werewolf Man goes to grab it, and he gets knocked backwards, and everyone realizes something is afoot here, and it's revealed Werewolf Man is, in fact, Werewolf Man. So they're locked in a cage and there's some conversations in there about Elsa and how she's turned on her family. And she, she says this line that you don't need to say much more than this. You don't need to elaborate on this, but you understand where she just says, none of you are worthy of this stone. And nothing she does makes it seem like she's, she's ambitious for the sake of power. It's not that her motivation is to continue the legacy. It's not that she like, if I have this, then I will be able to. It's none of those things. The thing that makes it clear what she's up to is none of you are worthy of this. None of you should have this. And combine that with she left 20 years ago. I was trained not with him. Everyone was resentful of her being there. And she's there just to make sure that these people that do what they do don't have this power. Because they're not the right people to have it. Doesn't need to say a lot to understand exactly what's going on from just that little bit. So then we get, they're, they're locked in a cage and she's kind of upset right at first. Like she's like kind of scared of him, kind of like upset. Like you didn't tell me the truth. But he's like, why would you like me? And she, you know, hey, we got five. And he's like, we got five days until full, full moon. She's like, you don't understand. The stone will turn you in five seconds. They're going to turn you. You are going to eat me. And that's how this is about to go down. And and then he comes up with like, like okay, I've got, I got a plan. I, I need to recognize you. He starts to do this weird stuff where he's like smelling her head, which in almost any other context comes off, has a very different energy and vibe of a man that you just met 20 minutes earlier, 30 minutes earlier, runs up to you and starts smelling your hair and smelling your arms and like, look me in the eyes. Look me, don't break eye contact. He's like, what on earth are you doing? The audience is thinking the same thing. Well, what, this is a weird guy. And he's like, no, no, if I can recognize you. Like if I, if I can just, on that primal level, I know your smell I know your eyes, and I know that you're a friend. Maybe you won't die after all. Um, And then it kind of rolls around. They come up with the bloodstone, shoot it in there, turn him into a werewolf. Werewolf doesn't look great. 
Uh, and it, it's a, it's in a tricky spot. And I, I think Man Thing, when they first the first shot of Man Thing, when he's like looking through the branches and you just kind of see his face through there, I don't think that shot looks very well. But both times I watched, it, I was like, "Ooh, that's not that's not a good sign. That looks like Snuffleupagus or something like that. Like, what's going on here?" When you see him in full, I think he looks a lot better. Uh, and uh, in the interview after the movie at the world premiere I was at. He talked, he was actually going to be in person, but he got COVID. So he couldn't come to the film festival. He's like, I so wanted to be there, but I couldn't. So he actually did it as a zoom call where he was zooming into the theater. And so they had a mic so he could hear the audience in the theater and we could hear him. Like it was literally a zoom call for a room full of people. And they had some technical issues. So there was multiple times where he's just sitting there staring at us, listening to us for 30 seconds while waiting for whatever is about to happen because they, they flipped the wrong button or whatever. And he was fully aware of what was going on. It was like laughing at the situation while we were laughing at it. Anyway, but he talked about how they went as practical as they could and they actually had like a man-thing creature on set, but they did replace it with CGI. And the one shot that's still practical is the arm coming out that hugs Jack, Werewolf Man. Everything else we've got CGI replaced. The first shot of Man-Thing I didn't think was good. The rest of them I thought, I thought worked pretty well. And then you get to, to our werewolf and... Um, I know you're trying to like do this throwback to the 30s, 40s, 50s monster movies. I would have kept working on that one. It just, it just, it felt a little bit too um, wig put on a guy, fake sideburns put on a guy. I just, I wasn't crazy about that one. But the sequence itself, pretty cool. So they change him, and fog starts spraying everywhere, and they do the classic horror shots of. Uh, you see her reaction to what's happening. Strobelite going through, just seeing these glimpses of him transforming. That's a cool shot right there. That is like classic throwback horror. Um, just all the right vibes, energy, and what they were going for with that one. Um, and then you can't see exactly what's going on. And then the werewolf just able to grab stepmom and start like attacking her arm. I don't know why she was dumb enough to stand next to the cage, but... He's able to break out and just this big action sequence unfolds where everyone is trying to catch him and he's just ripping dudes up. And they found a way to have like this very beastly monster, vicious style to him, but also very agile. So it's kind of combining just the harsh, the uh, the brutality and size of a monster with, with a human's ability to move. So even the way they visualized our werewolf fighting people and tearing them to pieces. I thought it was pretty cool. And in the mix also, Elsa escapes. And so she starts to um, beat dudes up herself. And you kind of get your, your big gigantic throwdown fight in here where this one, this, this is what I felt like some of the other ones needed to have, the, not the scope and size of this, but more the length. We could add something more longer fights earlier, not just these two punch kick, one throw deals earlier on. Um, so, but... Get all sorts of fun things happening in here of the martial arts fights. Creature jumping around and it was like wire work looking stuff where they float just a little bit while the wire guides them. Totally down for that with the style that they were going for. And then just like continuing that monster movie vibe with sometimes these long shots of the creature just popping out of nowhere. But then having fight choreography to it as well. Like a real nice mix of horror, action, very cool stuff. A few days back, I put out a video talking about some of the directors that I think could handle Blade really well. And I, I threw the director of this one, Michael Giacchino, who he's, a, if you don't know, he's one of the A-list composers of the last 20 years. I mean, he did Star Trek, the Planet of the Apes movies, Rogue One. I mean, this guy's done a ton, a ton of a-list blockbuster franchise. The, he did the Jurassic World films. He's a top guy. Now he's getting into directing. And you think, like, where this one does horror, it does fight choreography, it does action, self-contained story, but that doesn't feel like it violates the rules of the MCU. It does all that. You look at the sequence and you go, well, maybe that could be the guy to take over Blade right there. I don't know. Maybe. Could be. But all sorts of cool stuff happening. And you get to the point in time where eventually... Um, Elsa, it's Elsa and Werewolf Man, and they're able to make eye contact, and he decides he's he's not going to kill her. He runs off, and Elsa's there. She's got her stone, and she's had, I guess she's had it for a while, and it's in her pocket, but she, she doesn't want to use it against this now friend of hers. And Stepmom walks up and is going to kill her, and you, all the reasons she's resentful of her 
stepdaughter for betraying the cause and the mission and everything like that. And it's saying all this, pointing a gun at her, and then Man Thing shows back up, <laughs> grabs her, disintegrates her, and then she's like, oh, your friend's that way. Just all these nasty little things they could do. Even in the fight, they have blood spray on the screen and stuff like that. Just stuff you can't really do in a PG-13 blockbuster movie. You can actually do in this one now that it's black and white and a special. But Man Thing gets his gets to join in just a little bit to be the Calvary that saves the day at the end. And uh, uh, she gets the stone that she's going to use not to just hunt monsters for no reason and enabling these killers to do that. Sits down... And then color starts to form across her and uh, somewhere over the rainbow starts to play. And then outside we see our friend Ted and uh, Jack Werewolf Man sitting down to kind of enjoy a game of cards and continue on with their lives. So I, I just thought that it was um, something different enough, simple enough, but different enough that has a unique style, that it's this throwback monster movie story that captures that vibe and the energy the, the even the score the melodramatic shots with the strobe light and silhouette transformations long takes during the action sequences they're on a real practical set this whole time there's cgi for one of the monsters and some other little things in here but for the most part you're watching real things happen there's cheesiness to it but it's all intentional it's campy but it's intentional and it just was something different you don't get things like this very often. Something that is an homage to these low-tech uh, classic monster movies, but from a studio with all the resources in the world, merging them together. Like, I, I watched it and I went, okay, that's way, way cooler than I thought, I thought that it was going to be. And I hope they do more of these, these little risks and tell more of these little self-contained stories. Recurring theme here, hey, 50 minutes, probably too short. Hour and 10 minutes? Tell a little self-contained story like this? A little adventure with some, some more obscure characters, more obscure graphic novels, translating them to film without the weight of the rest of the MCU, without needing to tie into anything. Just tell this little story, smaller budget. It's not a big, gigantic blockbuster. Get someone that has a real interesting creative vision that it's absolutely a risk, but let them go for it. I think that's a risk worth take th taking. And you know, we're at the end of phase four of the MCU, and there actually have been a lot of risks in here. There have been some things that are a little bit more straightforward, but I think most of the things they've done have had something about them that breaks the mold of what they did before, and I think a lot of it hasn't worked all that well. A lot of it hasn't been up to the standard, but I appreciate the risks that they're taking in some of this, and I think this is probably the riskiest thing they've done that I thought, that one worked. That's it right there. Try that. And even some of the risks that they did, part of even probably the problem was that they did try to, they tried to do big, gigantic, you know, with Eternals didn't work for me. It was a risk. It was bold. It was different. But they tried to do big blockbuster with big risk and merge blockbuster with risky thing and artsy th and it didn't come together. You think, what if that hadn't been big blockbuster? What if that had been smaller budget, maybe for Disney Plus and you know, give Chloe Zhao the freedom to tell that story the way she wanted without the constraints of having to be big blockbuster. I think it would have worked a lot better. Give it more runtime to let it play out. So I, I think there's something to do with Disney Plus that there's outside the box things that you can do. And I think this is a, the, the lesson. Learn that from this one. Like, do stuff like this that's different. So um, all in all, um, my as the recurring theme in here, the big issue... I just wish it was 20 minutes longer, 15 minutes longer. I don't know what the number is. But I think, especially in the middle, you could have paused, a little bit more action, a little bit more conflict, te or tension, payoff release, and a little, maybe a little bit more time with their characters. I didn't actually need a lot more. Um, maybe with our werewolf. I think getting to know what, what has he been doing up in his life up to this point in time. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know exactly what that means, but you know, as, as our title character, he's designed as a mystery. And I, I saw a few reviews like, oh, another bait and switch. It says that it's about uh, a werewolf. It's supposed to be about this man, but instead it was about a woman. Like, they're, they're co-leads. They, there's like a mystery around him. That's the whole concept of it. Like, it's not like he's not central to the story. It's not like he doesn't do heroic things and accomplish his mission. No, he does all those things. He's the one that frees Ted. He's the one that kills all the bad guys at the end. 
But he's a mystery character. You don't know exactly what's going on with him until, you know, we learn something about 40% of the way through and we learn another something about 75% of the way through. Whereas her, we have a better idea from the beginning to end and she's kind of our point of reference character. Um, so I, I, I thought that that was a nice pairing. It worked really well to communicate information without undermining either one of the characters. But I, I, I other big thought on this one, I thought... I sure hope we get to see more of these two characters. I want to see another adventure with, with Elsa. I want to see another adventure with werewolf, man-thing. All three of them, the, the survivors. I want to see all three of them again. More of them, which is the same thing I guess that I said before. Of like, I just, just want more time with them on another adventure in this part of the MCU. And maybe that's the plan, is that they get a special every Halloween, every October. That'd be pretty cool. Like, just these little hour, hour and ten minute Halloween spooky specials in black and white playing homage to different throwback monster movies. That'd be pretty cool. And I'd be all down for it. Anyway, that's my take on Werewolf by Night. Let me know what you thought about it down below in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching. You can check out more of my Marvel content right over there. And keep talking movies and TV.